okay hi yeah obviously i'm cycling um this is how it goes for me often things that i'm thinking about happen in um transitional spaces and i don't have time <laughs> to stop now to record this video so i'm literally just gonna say the headlines of the things i want to say and i'm gonna come back to it later i'm pulling out the tail of the thought like a dream when you like catch it backwards and you pull it into space so uh, the images are or the questions are do all neurodivergent people struggle to understand how data backup systems work yeah, like absolutely. external hard drives where basically like time machine i don't understand it yeah, i'll go into it more later the other thing is orientation and your title of your exhibition everyone facing in the same direction i wanted to say something about it before and i don't think i did um so i want to say something about that um yeah in relation to orientation and flattening of diversity I want to tell you about a book that I read a while ago and something else that I can't remember. But now I need to continue my cycle ride because I'm going to be late otherwise. So, to be continued. I have always struggled in some ways to work and communicate and collaborate and manage and function really I had this complete fucking breakdown in a like a mock exam where I just couldn't write a creative essay and like I yeah I completely failed English um and it was just all of the stress and then i found out or they they were like we think you're dyslexic um i went and did a test and they were like yes you are but there were loads of other things going on at the time um have always experienced quite intense depression and anxiety that's always kind of just been a normal part of my existence um never knew why just was like i'm just built this way it was my English teacher that picked up on it um, and this was because I uh, was struggling to process um, questions that was being given to me um, and I couldn't deal with um, being put on the spot in the classroom as well and being asked questions in front of everybody. But that, and that the term neurodiversity, when I learned of it, and this idea that there was a norm that I was somehow not getting or that I was somehow violating, that term has always really landed with me and sp spoken to me. You noted the, you know, the, the lack of representation and the underdiagnosis of, um, you know, black and people of colour and migrant communities. And, and that's, you know, very true because you know i also can see how that for me it's also taken a long time to come to terms with it because i also couldn't see or didn't see um or hear from or you know perhaps i had quite a narrow view of, of how autism presents a big thing about it is like this underlying feeling of being a bit of an imposter so feeling like that with depression and anxiety and also not matching what I thought was the stereotypical kind of ADHD person. You know, and it wasn't until I really peeled back layers of, of my own self, my own experience and, and some of the things that I um, struggle with on a day to day basis that it kind of dawned on me that this could actually be neurological. So yeah, I didn't come across as neurodiverse. Um, I was doing a lot of quite intense overcompensation now on reflection. And realising that I have ADHD made me realise that a lot of the diagnosis criteria comes down to whether I cause an inconvenience for a teacher, for example. 
or an employer. Am I fidgety? Am I, do I look like I'm concentrating? <coughs> well, I became very good at looking like I was concentrating. I get mad and I get mad at, I'm like, why the hell is it taking me an hour to write a simple response? Why am I laying down for three hours paralyzed like I can't move for no reason? Why do I feel like sometimes I start working at 7 a.m. on a project or I'm writing something and I can't stop writing until 11 p.m. because I just really want to do it? There's just this kind of aspect of it where it's like, I feel like you can just drag yourself crazy thinking about what is really just your individual self. Like it feels very individualistic sometimes thinking about your divergence, like all the little, you know, things. But maybe people, you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to say, I can only speak for myself, you know. Why do I feel soft? Why do I not just like shake it off and focus? Why don't I just work harder? Why don't I put a bit more guilt about myself? Why don't you hustle? Why don't you grind, do all these, these things? And then another half of me goes, wait, why don't you just take your time? Why don't you heal? Why don't you rest? You're, I'm always in extremities. Is everybody? I think it was exasperated by menopause. Um, I think I probably did have it before. In fact, looking back, my parents said that they could really relate to the fact that I probably did have it as a child. But as a woman, it wasn't diagnosed then. So... And how did I feel about that? I suppose for a while I felt quite angry and quite upset that I couldn't have had the support, you know, when I was younger. But then now I've come to a place of acceptance. There's aspects of the ADHD continuum and the, and the autism spectrum that I think I probably would, it would explain a lot and would help me as labels and would help me manage better um, with my functioning and my communication. But it just feels at this point like what is, like what would I even gain by going down that diagnostic route? Because I've heard so many things about. <sighs> you know, I think these are things that we can all to various degrees experience, but then yeah, I do wonder about that. I do wonder, like, when does it then tip over into the territory of being disabling? With being distracted, I really feel like most of our society is challenged with the same things that ADHD people are challenged with. It's just that for us ADHD folks, it's really extreme, it's really overwhelming, and it's ever-present. It's every day. So if you are someone who's challenged with distractedness or uh, restlessness in the body or just this inability to really calm down to really feel this inner sense of peace and restfulness what the course is about is learning how to get truly settled and it's working with our body sensations people sort of question right like, well there's nothing even wrong with you or that that's that's what i've heard or you know you're just sensitive like you're just too sensitive you're just thinking about it too much you just whatever and there's all these things that i am just. And part of that for me is that I feel like my nervous system connects to other people's nervous system the way that Wi-Fi connects. <laughs> like when you're, like when you go to a cafe or a place that you've been to before, like it's an automatic connection and it's really difficult to, um, kind of find the boundary i'm taking on aspects of other people you know their their emotions um their energy that you know it had an impact on my physical body you can even cup your palms here so you come up onto your fingertips in the time when i went through diagnostic processes around this stuff um, 
mostly around like autism diagnosis which was like eight years ago how the only way that at the time I could like think about this information was exactly like this skylight it was like the diagnostic process which for me was quite traumatic was like a window like one of maybe like many windows or many like lenses that would let in a certain view or a certain light or perspective and it could shine some information on um an experience but it's not like it's not like the only the only light or the only information or something like that. I guess thinking about how many people are really, really like, I don't know, struggling to try and even attempt to ask for a diagnosis thing. And then there's like so many steps in it that it just messes with your head. Like it's like so inaccessible, I think in general. Um, so what the heck? began to get to a point where I self-diagnosed with ADHD. I then pursued my GP about it and it was quite difficult. I had to really fight for it. And because of my other diagnosed um, impairments, they, they were sort of like, you know, oh, but you do have anxiety. Oh, could you think, do you think it could be your OCD? And I had to be like, listen, it's a comorbidity. That's what it is. Once I'd made up my mind you know um at the age of 34 that um this is something that i experience and that it's something i deserve support with so i never considered that i might have adhd um i've been quite a quiet person in my life and my friend who had trained in primary care had suggested it to me um, I had a really easy experience, I think, with my diagnosis. Um, like, I was very believed by the doctor, the GP. I am going through a diagnosis at the moment, and I did go the NHS route, and I am at the last stage now, so I've got my final appointment in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm quite nervous about that. And, and right from the off, I felt like they were asking questions that they needed specific answers to and I didn't feel like I was giving them those answers so that kind of made me question the whole thing a lot more and then even when you do get diagnosed a lot of people don't even get any help and I was like confused and I was scared and then I went to my GP right and I spoke about these things and then I said very clearly I think I'm autistic and I think I need to be assessed and then she was like what and I was like I think I need to be assessed I'm maybe autistic and then like she made me do this form and I had to do it again and again and it took a very long time until I even got to the stage of like I've done this form and I got really confused I was like can you do this form with me because I don't understand it and the doctor was just like oh yeah well that means you're autistic you're supposed to be confused by it and I was like what and like that was a horrible experience and I don't know if that's true like I haven't I heard that from anyone else, but um, when I actually started the formal diagnosis, which was very recent, um, I told them about that experience and they were like, oh my God, that's not, that's horrible. Like, I'm so sorry. The rules have been written about the language and I have attended many a workshop, many a talk about people unpacking this language. And yet I, it is like banging my head against a fucking wall. I just can't, um, it, it takes so much power, like brain power and time to reach a point where I am I'm, I'm immersed in that language enough to be able to start using it and forming it within, uh, I guess, my vision. You never really got past the point of me talking to somebody and being put forward as as to to get a full diagnosis and I just felt like I've identified a lot of things I've done it in the form myself it that whole process made me feel less like I had ADHD and has put me off pursuing it for a while
I once had a psychiatrist who said, described to me that like diagnoses are just groups of symptoms that people put together and sort of the inaccuracy of that kind of freaks me out. Little things like being gaslit or if you're uh, a very anxious, if you're a particularly anxiously inclined person, it's like a very tricky one where like you're trying to trust things in your interiority that they can't tell and yet you're kind of having to negotiate between that and what they're telling you and it gets wor weirder still when you become when you have a certain amount of conviction in something that's antithetical to what they're saying to you and uh, my therapist constantly brings up the fact that oh constantly brought up the fact that uh, I she's she was saying like oh you know I think you might have ADHD or AD or be autistic and I'm like okay well you know I'm here for a different set of reasons so I think I'm struggling to kind of like um accept that as a thing from her um and I kind of like flat outright rejected that and it's not the first time that someone has said something to me that I have been like no that's that that's not true like it not specifically around being neurodivergent but um in, in other things and that I've later come to like reconcile as being a fairly accurate pinpointing of the thing that's going on with me about a year later maybe I had my first appointment at a gender identity clinic after being on the waiting list for a million years and they brought up the fact that I was autistic. This woman was looking at my medical records and she was like, oh, I see here that, that you're autistic. And she started trying to bring that into the conversation and almost use it as a reason why things might be difficult or why I might not understand my gender or it was really weird and a complete curveball and I, I didn't really know how to respond to that because I just did not expect that something so something that felt so unofficial when talking to the doctor about it I didn't even have like a formal diagnosis I just mentioned it to my doctor and begun the process and here was this other medical expert from another facility bringing it up as a potential barrier to healthcare. I, I just wonder what that whole process would have looked like if I had more agency over um, referring myself, speaking to specialists, um, and whether the actual process wasn't so guarded or so arbitrated by somebody else it, just, it makes no sense but it makes no sense because they don't know what to do with us we don't know what to do with ourselves because they just don't want us to live you know um there is nothing to make the diagnosis a useful tool nothing there is nothing that makes the diagnosis something that revolutionizes you unless what you need is access to medicine in which case yes sure some of us need medication cool um and then that process can be really useful sovereignty that doesn't just come from i got my nhs diagnosis of adhd two weeks ago and this is my first week on elvance which is an amphetamine <laughs> So maybe I'll be better at stringing my thoughts together on this, who knows. But that's about it. They will still give you the medication and go, and now try to be typical. And you know, if you ever get a seizure on a train or you start having a meltdown or something, why don't you take out your little lanyard that's got the little daisies on it so everybody knows that you're just a little bit different. <laughs> it's like, what? Well, how is this helpful? How is this helpful? Maybe it is. Am I? Maybe I'm just ignorant to my own experience. But maybe there is also frustration here. I don't know. I'm. I'm just unpacking it as I go.
you know, thinking about how some of the things that I struggle with, I'm now looking at through the lens of autism in a way that I hadn't before. Um, you know, and something that it is encouraging me to do is, you know, have a lot more compassion for myself, actually. Um, you know, I could definitely see how certain behaviours I was really hard on myself about. One breath back to centre. Bend into your knees. Let's come into Malasana squat pose just for a moment. Hands in Hakini Mudra at the heart. And have all of your fingertips together. Hakini Mudra is associated with concentration and focus, but also inclusion, inclusivity, so you can see all the space, which is welcoming and embracing. You know, somebody who also, you know, explores, um, you know, traditions that are not my kind of direct ancestry or, you know, lineage, just to think, you know, how can I um, access this tradition in a way um, where I honour it, you know, where I treat it with reverence and where there's an aspect of, you know, reciprocity. Dance has always been the easiest activity to find myself in. It's almost as if you're so calm within your thoughts that there isn't any, which is weird. But I guess the idea of the movement it's like a thinking body. It's like your brain is within every muscle. That's what it felt like for me. So it wasn't just placed within this one engine, but actually my body in a way, I guess, was <laughs> sovereign or like independent or had this autonomy to itself. It's, it's really hard, <laughs> like, it's really hard to cry something, it's really hard. Um, and because I've got this feedback from the water, it's like there's a partner, like the environment you're in is also a partner in your, in your learning. It was more for me about like, I feel something when I touch this rock and not this rock. And I move that stick from there to there and then move it back again. And it just, things would feel right and things would feel wrong. And it was a sense of right and wrong that no one else seemed to be talking about. So for me, I was like, well, that's just, that's magic. That's ritual. And now I realise that there's a whole other language to describe that, which is neurodivergence. Finding ways to you know, really come back into my body and learn to, you know, listen to it more, learn to hear what it is that it's asking of me. I've gotten really used to, you know, on the one hand, making excuses <laughs> for certain behaviours, um, if I'm really blunt, but then also... Um, <laughs> also kind of... Yeah, like, I mean, I, I, it's like a feeling, it's hard to put into words, but you know, this this kind of, it's also been this real like suppression of, of certain maybe needs or, or desires that I had around my own body, around its capability. Um, I think I'd really put a lot of limits on myself. And I think that process, because we're talking a bit about sovereignty, is really interesting in how it can group together a load of different experiences. So in the case of your title, I love it because it spatializes an experience that many people are having, which is we're facing in the direction of um, a set of criteria or like a body that is deciding something. I got my official autism diagnosis earlier this week and 
I think it sucks the amount of sovereignty that that has given me. I think it's great for me personally, but with self-diagnosis, it's very easy to gaslight yourself. Whereas when someone else has said to you, yeah, this is autism, but also there's a whole lot of other stuff going on, that sovereignty, that kind of like, it almost, it almost gave it to me. I'm almost like, well, now I can fucking move forward. Now I can be confident. There's no question of anything. I know what I, well, I'm figuring out what I need and I'm going to fucking well fight for it. And that's good because it gives me a sense of power if I take it. It's easy to not take it, but you, I think as trans people, we do need to take it. We need to take that power and we need to advocate for ourselves very very strongly a lot of the time but also it fucking sucks <laughs> because I can't rely on any expert I can't rely on any professional to give me answers I enact the universal law of free will now I enact the universal law of free will now. I call upon all divine realms and dimensions to witness this declaration of full sovereignty and to uphold its integrity and original intention. Do you ever feel like the world should be built differently? What if loads of like neurotypical people were given drugs to make them, okay, drugs is a bit heavy of a word, medication to um, enable them to engage in the neurodiverse world? What if it wasn't the other way around? What if the world was built not for the neurotypical, but for the neurodiverse? It must be a very bizarre world, for example, for an animal that spends 90% time in the air to look down on Earth and be like, why is everybody walking? Like, why aren't you flying? You know, I sometimes feel like that kind of creature. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm like a bird. Um, it's more like when you feel like flying is the best option and you're kind of like, in a way, capable of doing that in your own way. Go ahead and close your eyes and do another Yeah, I think the word sovereignty is really interesting in relation to neurodiversity and to um, a kind of pathologizing model. Um, sovereignty, both in the sense of like, edges and borders and kind of like guardianship or stewardship of experience. You know, I think something that for me has been really important to come to terms with, you know, as somebody, somebody who's really struggled with articulating my boundaries and, and my needs, especially in relation to um, other people has been to you know remember that all of these things are so fluid and to not be so i guess fixed in in where the lines are and i've learned to find my self-governed power my self-sustainability my strength through seeing my connections with other people sometimes as tools i guess what i mean is when i need something from someone i don't need to be at their mercy i don't i don't need to give them power and actually now i have this incredible ability to navigate the healthcare system this incredible ability to navigate businesses and corporations and societies you know how how sometimes um yeah these behaviors that are um you know pathologized are 
and it are seen as these things that we need to, you know, suppress um, or mask um, about ourselves are actually part of and contribute to our gifts. You know, I'm, I'm really interested in that, like in in that reframing of, of some of my experiences and, and some of the things that <clears throat> have been really challenging um, and continue to be, you know, challenging within my experience. The Lorna Wings Centre assessor said, I seem to use being smiley and being helpful as a coping strategy. It's taken me a long time to really understand how pervasive and impactful this has been in my life. And I'm still figuring out what masking actually looks like or is covering up in me. All of this is still something that I deal with today as a 25 year old. Um, but because I've like kind of had the diagnosis, di diagnosis, um, since I was like 16, 17, I've like kind of learned how to deal with some things, but it still really does come into like everyday life for me, like at work and like with my relationships and friendships. The weirdo that I am inside, I, I don't think that I know who she is. And I don't know if I know if I believe in an authentic self or anything like that, but there's definitely been this stifling of who I am. You know, all these different versions of myself and the versions that are now emerging now that this kind of unmasking is happening, because I think that's also where I'm at. You know, where there are all these like parts of me that have been kind of latent, you know, always there, um, but are now kind of, you know, peeking their head up, shyly peeking their head up. And yeah, I'm figuring out how to like integrate them. Having my diagnosis has like been a huge like and like being authentically myself in that way has also been like a massive permission for the people because like so many people I know have like seen me and been like you know well maybe not but like they've they've seen traits in me that they recognize in themselves and like I've like go and go find it out for yourself go and like look into it because it could be life-changing a lot of neurodivergent people, a lot of trans people. What we need is not to feel like we need to be in power, right? It's to feel like we can just take a step back. It's to feel like we can rest. I went into a bit of a rut last year, th thinking about like, you know, like free will and really in a large sense about agency and like how much agency I have relative to like a more idealized functional person how much agency anybody has, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, part of kind of, for me, expanding into feeling more free is also knowing more clearly, um, you know, where I end and another person begins. It has enabled me a space to spin some webs in new directions, although it feels like I'm spinning a web in a constantly moving landscape. Uh, so to me, that is part of sovereignty because when I found out I had ADHD, yes, a, a switch was turned on. But in another sense, when people ask me, well, what do you want? How am I meant to know what I want? It's been constructed over years of other people's ideas. I do question myself a bit a lot. Like, is it just the desire to have a label? I don't really like the labels that I have. And every label, I think, in a way, changes the way you perceive yourself. Ultimately, it doesn't come up as much as it used to, you know, because at the end of the day, it's just me living my life. <laughs> just using the right words at the right times to get the right things, whether that's something from the medical system, whether that's access to community. It's just like, what do I need to share at what time? To who? And does it matter? Into your energy field, your emotions and your body. Identifying how you're feeling on a scale of one to 10 when it comes to feeling sovereignty. Again, the question is who created this system and who is this system for? And, I, and yes, it could link to your 
fear, I don't know, or your question of the typicality of people or who set the standard, who sets the norm. Um, and I think it's time to fuck the norm. I think it's time to just be and exist and not cause harm to others and be kind to your community. You know, as kind of queer, um, you know, differently gendered, uh, neurodivergent subjects, you know, there are these um, terms and labels and categories we can use to, um, you know, identify and like group ourselves and each other. And that's really great because, you know, it helps us to find each other you know when we need each other when we're seeking yeah you know community but I'm also aware you know the deeper I get into my own self-individuation journey the more that I realize that these categories can also be quite limiting um you know and they can also be ways to I guess police and also kind of limit each other so I, again I try to introduce a fluidity you know in how I access and move through these different categories of, of identity like I don't ever want to you know I think something I'm really invested in in my own self-individuation journey is um, transformation and being open to changing and growing and evolving you know regardless of how you know, hard and sometimes painful and, and kind of sticky it can get. Understanding of di divergent and diverse and, and different and differently different to the difference that we're currently looking at perspectives that makes more space also for like future emergent categories. Allow those who have extremely huge dreams and ambitions and those who are creative to thrive and it's time for those who wish to have a simple life to have that and it's time for those who have problems with communicating to receive tools that can be created for them to communicate easily and it's time for all of us to just be a little bit more human. And the shittiest part is, I have no idea what that even means. I have no idea where that even begins. So, yeah, it's definitely a big problem because nobody really has a solution. So instead of stopping, we're just going, well, let's let this mess continue until we have something better instead. Um, it's a weirdly heartbreaking idea and it's our reality.